Um, I haven't uh, had an opportunity to talk about this particular piece of work yet. And so uh, it, it was a good excuse to uh, sit down and think a little bit more carefully about it and also uh, put together a talk. Um, so it, th this, is, this is based on work uh, that I did with, with no Nozomo Kobayashi, who is a, a student of, of uh, Tatsuma Nishioka. He came to visit me uh, last, uh, last fall and it, it worked out really well. We got a, we got a paper from it. Uh, and the paper is uh, is is this one down here um, fr from last May. Uh, I've I put a couple of plots here to suggest that there's actually some perhaps experimental consequences for this work too, which is which is a little bit exciting. Although uh, I haven't uh, put together enough groundwork to really to really see that uh, myself or, or 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 show you so much in the talk, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of taste taste for that as we go along. So this first plot is a phase diagram for a, a mixture of uh, liquid helium three and, and four. Uh, and the idea is that these lines are second order phase transitions. Uh, so down, down here, you might have a, a superfluid phase. Up here is some normal phase. Up here in here is some mixed phase. And these lines are supposed to be uh, uh, second order phase transitions. Uh, that meet at some tricritical point in the middle. Uh, and similarly over here, this is another phase diagram for, for I think it's uh, iron chloride, some kind of magnetic compound. So there's a, a paramagnetic phase, uh, anti-ferromagnetic phase, also some mixed phase with again, uh, some phase separation lines that are second order that meet at some, some tricritical point. So there's some connection of, of what I'm talking today to, to try critical uh, systems. So the field theory I'm going to use, this ON56 theory, uh, is famously relevant uh, for, for, for those kinds of models. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, again, one of these computer talks. Um, I, I, I can't see most of your faces, and uh, I think it's better if um, if you stop me from time to time and, and uh, ask questions so, so I, can, I can say a little bit more and, and get a better sense for, for how much of my message is getting across. Anyway, let's get started. So I'll, I'll begin with a little bit of an outline. Uh, I, I think as it, as it turns out in the end, maybe half of the talk is gonna be just sort of background and motivation. I'll begin with my my kind of personal motivation for the, for the talk, uh, which has to do with uh, computing uh, boundary contributions uh, to the anomaly in the trace of the stress tensor. So this is something I've been quite interested in over the last three, four years. And I'll, I'll give you a sense of, of why, or try to give you a sense of why at the beginning of the talk. Uh, and then there's going to be a particular model that I'm going to focus on, this phi to the sixth theory in, in three dimensions. And as it turns out, this model is quite interesting in its own right. And so there's some more general motivation uh, that I'll give you a sense for uh, in the second half of the motivation, um, what other kinds of systems uh, this, uh, this theory might, uh, might be relevant for, and also some larger field theoretical issues that, that come up when you think about these, these, uh, this, this phi to the sixth theory. Okay, then finally, finally, I'll tell you what's in this paper. Um, uh, and they're basically two computations. One is a computation of a type A anomaly uh, in, this, in this stress tensor uh, trace, uh, which we'll get at by computing some kind of effective potential in a large N limit of this phi to the sixth theory. And the second is a B type anomaly computation. Um, which we'll get at through uh, a two-point function of the stress tensor, and then we'll wrap up. So that, that's my plan for today. Are, are there any questions before I, I, I start? Again, I have no idea if I'm, I'm communicating my message, or frankly, even if you can hear me. Everything is fine. Well, yes, I, I, at least we can hear you. So I guess there's okay. no question yet, but yes. Okay. So let, let's begin with the, the stress tensor trace. And I'll just begin very simply, um, although for the experts, this is gonna be uh, very old news. So if I have a, 
a conformally invariant theory, a theory that's scale invariant, I can often promote that to some more local notion of vial invariance in a, in a curve space time. So if I have some field theory that's in a, that I, I set up in a curve space time with some background metric. So gravity today is going to be purely a background uh, fixed notion. Uh, so I can use it as some external field to probe my system, but there never, there's never going to be graviton. But if I have such a theory that's vial invariant, so if I scale the metric by some uh, function uh, of a point, omega of x, the idea is the theory is supposed to be vial invariant. So I get the same theory back. It's a symmetry of the theory. And there's an infinitesimal notion of that, of that uh, scaling symmetry if omega is very close to the identity. And one consequence of that is that if I, if I vary my action with respect to this, uh, this scaling symmetry, well, by the chain rule, I can break that up into a variation of the action with respect to the metric and then of the metric with respect to sigma, or I can add, if I want additional matter fields to this to make it a more complicated expression. But the idea is that um, this is nothing uh, but the, uh, the definition of the trace of the stress tensor. And so, so classically, at least, if I have this vial invariance, I expect the, the trace of the stress tensor to vanish. Uh, but the, famously, that's not true in, in, uh, in a quantum mechanical sense. There's some, there's some anomalies uh, that I can add uh, or, or, or that show up, show up typically in, the, in, these, in these theories. Uh, maybe most famously in two dimensions. Uh, most of you are probably aware that the trace of the stress tensor doesn't vanish, but is proportional to the Ricci scalar curvature uh, for conformal field theories with a coefficient C, uh, which is, is quite important. Uh, the C central charge, it winds up also being the coefficient of the stress tensor two point function. Uh, there are nice theorems proved about it that in, in the renormalization group, we know that the C in the, at high energy has to be uh, larger than C at low energy, that there's some monotonicity uh, that, that kind of orders uh, these two-dimensional conformal field theories with respect to their normalization group. And there's more recent connections to uh, information theory, uh, entanglement entropy. There's an entanglement entropy proof of, uh, of this C theorem uh, due more recently to Huerta and Cassini about, what, 15 years ago. So there's some way of, of maybe mapping out the space of, uh, of quantum field theories or conformal field theories using this, this boundary central charge in two dimensions. And that's one of the things that I found kind of exciting about uh, these anomaly coefficients. You know, we, there's a you know, 4D, um, 4D uh, uh, analog of this, of this 2D central charge, which is almost as famous, um, that the trace of the stress tensor doesn't vanish in this sense, but is proportional to the vial curvature squared. That's what I'm using W here for in this expression. Uh, there's an Euler density term. And then there's some additional terms, which I'll, I'll ignore uh, today, which are, are scheme dependent, depend on how you, how you do your, uh, your regularization of the, of the field theory. There's often, people often separate here this notion of, I, I mentioned already in the, in the outline, this notion of A and B type anomalies. So I'm using here A for the A-type, often called A-type because of its sort of topological nature. It's proportional to this Euler density. When you in integrate the Euler density, you get the Euler characteristic. And, and this B-type guy, uh, which depends on the vial curvature. So the A-type, if you vary with respect to the, um, if you do some vial scaling, you get a total derivative, which will vanish upon integration over some compact manifold. But the B-type will be vial invariant all on its own because of the properties of the vial curvature. So that, that's what the separation of A and B-type is here. But these, these coefficients are, are, are similarly very important in the 4D context. The C here is also the coefficient of the, of the stress tensor two-point function, um, whereas A here, it's A that, that, that uh, winds up having this monotonicity property where high, the high energy limit of A is, is larger than the low energy limit. And again, there's entanglement entropy proofs of, of, this, uh, of this A theorem, which again uh, you know, connects this to uh, this, this whole it from qubit uh, program as well. And um, so there's some notion that you have this kind of uh, 
maybe there's there's some steps towards a map mapping out the structure of, of 4D QFTs using these kinds of uh, these kinds of quantities. So it, it's it's for those kinds of reasons that I've been I've been quite interested in these uh, in these central charges, these uh, anomaly coefficients A and C in the 4D case or C in the 2D case. And okay, so this is all known. And so what, what's left to do? Well, some things that are, 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 are much less known is that if, if you have a, a manifold, a curved manifold, which now has a boundary, uh, there wind up being uh, additional contributions to these, uh, uh, the, these, uh, this, this stress tensor trace. So in 2D, uh, there's nothing more you can do. In 2D, there's nothing more you can do. In 3D, there was nothing to start out with in the bulk. If there's no boundary, there's no anomaly. This, the, the trace of the stress tensor should vanish. But now if there's a boundary, uh, and that's how I've, I'm sort of indicating the presence of the boundary by this, this delta function here, delta of xn, uh, there wind up being a couple of extra terms uh, that show up. There's an A-type guy, which is associated with the Ricci scalar curvature of the boundary. And there's a B-type guy which is associated with the trace of the uh, extrinsic curvature uh, of, of this boundary surface. Excuse me, where I've removed the trace and by removing the trace, that's what makes it, makes it file invariant. I think as far as I understand, this was first pointed out in a paper by Graham and Witten from 1999. Although their concerns were maybe not completely aligned with this kind of conformal field theory approach but it was later appreciated uh, uh, maybe in greater detail, but in, in, in papers by people like uh, Schwimmer and, 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 uh, and Thyssen. Okay, and then in 4D, uh, again, well, well, we have the term I wrote down in the previous slide, which in, involves uh, the vial squared and the Euler density in the bulk, plus that uh, regulator term that I'm now ignoring. But now in the presence of the boundary, there are further uh, contributions uh, there's a trace k hat cubed term, which I'll, I'll give a coefficient b1, and there's a kw term, uh, extrinsic curvature times vial curvature, which I'll give a coefficient b2. And I'm not sh totally sure, but I think it was us. It was uh, me along with my graduate student at the time, Kuo Wei Huang and Christian Jensen, who who showed this uh, showed that this this was the structure of the of the boundary anomaly in, in the 4D case. Although there had been some work. Uh, at least for free theories, um, much, much earlier in the, in the 80s even, by people like Moss and, and maybe Dauker. Anyway, um, these, uh, these coefficients here, this B, B1, and B2, they're related um, uh, not to stress tensor correlation functions in the case of the boundary, but by something called displacement operator uh, correlation functions uh, in the case where, where, where there's a boundary. And so it's these, these characters, these A, B, B1, and B2, which will be kind of a cent central, central topic of, of the talk today. And it's the, these quant quantities that I've been kind of interested in, again, because of their potential to kind of uh, tell us fundamental things about uh, conformal field theories, conformal field, field theories with boundaries or defects, uh, what happens to them under RG flow. Indeed, there's this theorem from, from 2015 that uh, this quantity A organizes uh, boundary conformal field theories under uh, renormalization group flow, uh, just like A did in the 4D and the, and the 2D case as well. So the strategy going forward, how do you compute these quantities? I mean, that's kind of what I want to do today. Um, there's sort of two, two different strategies. Um, to compute A, uh, one standard technique is uh, to choose some space uh, with uh, a vanishing vial curvature. And if you do that, you know, see, based on, on what's, what's here, um, Well, actually, I should I should really say not just vanishing vial curvature, but also vanishing uh, extrinsic curvature for the boundary contribution as well. Uh, so I, I I'll just have a contribution from this AR term in, in 3D anyway. 
uh, we will compute the partition function on that space. So for example, let's say a hemisphere or anti de Sitter space. Um, I should really say k hat. It will have some kind of a, a short distance divergence that we can regulate at a scale lambda that will give us some kind of log lambda in the partition function. And then we vary the log with respect to the partition function. Uh, and at the end of the day, whoops. Uh, we get, we get, we get, we'll find, uh, we know that the trace of the stress tensor integrated is the integrated uh, Ricci scalar. And so we'll be able to isolate from this process by varying our some, some effective action. So this is now a W that's the effective action, not W that's the vial curvature anymore. So sorry for the change in notation. But by varying the effective action with respect to this scale, uh, we'll be able to isolate A. So that's, that's the plan for how, how, how one computes A in general. And we'll, we'll see a specific example of that uh, later in the talk. And then B, I said, we get that from some, some displacement operator. Uh, so in that case, uh, I should, I guess, say a little bit about what I mean by a displacement operator. So there's three different ways of, of, of maybe thinking about it in the case where there's a boundary. Uh, maybe the most natural way is to think about um, it as an operator whose, whose sort of conjugate source is, is the position of the boundary. So if I vary some effective action with respect to that position, uh, that gives me the operator, which I'm calling dn, the displacement operator. Um, now, the boundary also breaks uh, translation invariance in, in the direction normal to the boundary. And so the stress tensor is no longer completely conserved. It's only convert, conserved in the tangential directions along which I still have translation invariance. Uh, the amount by which it's violated in this perpendicular direction is proportional again to the displacement uh, operator. So that's the second way of thinking about this operator via some kind of ward identity. And the third, which is gonna be very useful for today's talk, I can write a little pillbox around my boundary and I can integrate up uh, the stress tensor, or at least the normal component of the stress tensor. But what, 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 sorry, I'm gonna integrate the divergence of the stress tensor along this pillbox. And, and, and through a kind of Gauss law argument, it's the same argument you go through to figure out the electric field near a ch charged uh, sheet. Uh, one finds that the, um, the normal normal component of the stress tensor and the boundary limit is precisely the displacement operator. So there is a very, very close connection between these displacement operator correlation functions and stress tensor correlation functions in the, in the, in the case of a, of a boundary, which may be not so surprising since I was talking earlier about how these bulk central charges, these C central charges were given by uh, uh, stress tensor two point functions. Okay, so the, the, the strategy here is in this case, we'll, we'll, we'll go and we'll try and compute uh, correlation functions of the displacement operator by looking at correlation functions of the stress tensor in some boundary limit. That's how we'll get it B. So on the boundary, since I have a, I have conformal symmetry on the boundary, the displacement operator two point function is just fixed up to a number. There's secretly some scale invariance because of the divergence in this two point function as X goes to zero. And I match that scale invariance uh, to the, the, the anomaly in the trace. And the anomaly in the trace is precisely some kind of, uh, some kind of secret scale invariance in the theory. And that's gonna tell me that this central charge B on the boundary is proportional to CNN with some, some particular coefficient that, that, that sticks by my, my definitions. So that's the second thing we'll do in the talk today. We're gonna to compute A from some sort of effective uh, partition function, in fact, on anti de Sitter space. And then um, we'll calculate this, this coefficient B from uh, a stress tensor two point function. So are there, are there questions about this, this whole anomaly stuff? I, I hope that's, I guess it's kind of a, a formal way to begin the talk. Uh, for a lot of people, but I was hoping that's, that's sort of my personal take on it. I, I got a question. Uh, yes, please. Uh, so this uh, uh, displacement operator is uh, something to do with uh, 
uh, pressure uh, pressure uh, on on the boundary oh yeah i guess it i guess it probably should there should be some way of thinking about it that way right because if i think about right because like the normal normal component of the stress tensor um or, or any diagonal component of the stress tensor that's not a time component, I, I should be able to think, as, think of as maybe as some kind of pressure. Um, I, I've never done that before. I guess w whenever I think of pressure, I think about something at some non-zero temperature. In here, of course, I'm always gonna be exactly at zero temperature, but uh, yeah, I, th I think that's probably a, a nice way of thinking about it. Some sort of like Casimir pressure. Never thought about it that way before though. Yeah, something to do with the Casimir energy, I guess. Yeah, Casimir pressure. Yeah, that is the right term. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Again, that's kind of my personal motivation. So why I was excited about this this project because I really wanted some way of computing these uh, these coefficients a and b um, to get some additional examples of, of boundary conformal field theories where we know what these quantities are and how they behave. And maybe we, you know, from having some collection of examples, some growing collection of examples, we can figure out more general patterns and, and understand something deeper about the structure of these, of these conformal field theories. So to do that, so though, I, I need some system. Can I, yeah. can I ask you a question? So yeah, sure. so, so in principle, like, I mean, you can compute all of these anomalies again by some kind of heat kernel method, right? So the, yeah, the heat kernel methods are, seem to be best adapted for free theories. So in, in, the, in the case where I have a free theory, uh, I, I can get it most of these quantities, but uh, more generally, I don't, I don't know how to, how to use the heat kernel. Right, probably the fact that there's also a boundary, I mean, would make it more complicated. Oh, it, it does, it does. There, there are many more terms in these heat kernel computations that show up. Uh, it, you, you can find a lot of these papers, but the people, um, of course, Vasilovich, who, who's done this, and then um, oh, the other, other people whose, whose names are escaping me at the moment, but yeah, they, they, get, they get quite complicated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just, um, I have a question. Could you please go back on the previous slide? Sure. So the, this one, the right. So the two point function for the displacement operator. So this small d is the um, dimension of the boundary. So this, so when you say conformal invariance along the tangential directions, is that right? That fixes the two point function that's, of this. That's right. So whenever you have a boundary, you basically break the full conformal group down to the conformal group of, of, of boundary system. So, system so in d, one dimension less. Okay, okay, so D here is the dimension. So your space time is D plus one dimension then, is that right? My space time is actually D dimensions. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so the boundary would be D minus one, uh, but the displacement operator itself has dimension D, uh, which you can, you can sort of see from, some, from how it, how it from, from, from this expression here that it's just the boundary limit of TNN, which also must have dimension D. Oh, okay. So yeah, D is just the conformal dimension of my displacement operator. Yeah, thanks. Anything else? Okay, great. So let, let me con continue with my motivation, but this is now gonna be a kind of more general motivation that's connected with a particular uh, model I wanna use uh, to compute these coefficients A and B. So I wanna focus on a real old school model. Uh, this is just scalar, uh, scalar theory in, um, in three dimensions. It's gonna have O-N symmetry. So my, my scalar field will have N components. Here's my scalar field. I'm, I'm suppressing the fact that it has a, that it's really a vector in this O-N space. I'm suppressing these O-N indices just so my formulas look nicer, but always remember it's, it's, a, it's an N, N component vector. I'm gonna have this uh, sort of standard bulk form where I write down a kinetic term and then I write down all marginal and uh, or at least classically marginal and relevant operators uh, that are consistent with the O-N symmetry. 
uh, in three dimensions. So I get to go all the way up to phi to the sixth in three dimensions. And I have these three coefficients, m, r, and g. And then I have a boundary, right? So there's gonna be three more uh, terms that I can add that are consistent uh, uh, with the O-N symmetry and that, that have, um, that are again, classically marginal or relevant. There's a, there's a, a weird looking kinetic term, uh, which I'll argue I can just ignore uh, based on some very old work. There's an H1 phi squared term, which will be very uh, important for us going forward. And there's an H2 phi to the fourth term, which I'll say a little bit about, but I'll also try to ignore and, and maybe just leave for the future uh, for some more complete uh, treatment of this theory. So my boundary is always gonna be at z equals zero. And that's why I have a delta of z here, which just forces that, that term to live on the boundary. Okay, that's my system. And the system is, as I said, it's, it's quite interesting on its own. It's, for a long time, it's been, a, it's been a kind of theoretical laboratory to learn about renormalization group effects. People who don't wanna compute beta functions for gauge theories, maybe start by computing beta functions for scalar theories and try and see what happens as couplings run, what kinds of effects can show up. And I'll tell you a little bit about the work on this theory that, that happened in the early 80s. Uh, this system is also apparently in the condensed matter literature, it's, it's a model of, of a, of a so-called tricritical system. And if you read these papers from the 70s and 80s, it, you know, the beginning of their papers, they you know, talk about the general relevance. Uh, there are these systems, iron chloride, mixtures of helium-3 and helium-4, polymers and a theta solvent. So there are these uh, experimental systems which have this tricritical behavior, which maybe you can use this, uh, this phi to the six theory to learn something about. Uh, and, and many, many authors uh, have, have worked on this. Uh, this is a, a paper by Pizarski I'll talk about at some length from 81 by Bardeen, Moshe, and Bander, uh, and many others who also add a boundary. And it, it's work that continues to this, this day. The, 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 <laughs> what, what actually goes on in the system seems to be somewhat obscure, uh, even now 40 years after or 50 years after the initial, initial papers. There's a, there's a paper from this year which is trying to figure out something that uh, these people pointed out in, back in 1983. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that as, as we go forward. So here are these plots again uh, that I had on the title. Um, uh, this is uh, mixtures of helium-3 and helium-4 with this tricritical point at the middle. Or maybe you can get at some uh, critical exponents and other behavior from, from, the, from these, uh, this phi to the sixth theory. Here's this iron chloride where again, there may be some, some critical point sitting here. And then there's this notion of a theta solvent. So what I, what I understand that you have a polymer and a solvent and you know, the polymer can even either have like a positive interaction with the solvent or a negative interaction. And you can kind of tune that to some neutral point. And when you tune it where you know, it's neither sort of repulsive or attractive, this interaction between the solvent and the polymer, that's the so-called theta point. And it's at that point that there's supposed to be some kind of tricriticality in the system. And now if you've, you know, furthermore have the polymer attached to a boundary, um, uh, that begins to seem a lot like uh, the system I wrote down at the beginning. Um, apparently you should take an n, n to the n, n equals zero limit. That's something I think Pierre de Gens was arguing for again, way back in the eighties. And there's, there was, there's some work, work about this by people like Eisenriegler and Deal uh, you know, almost 40 years ago. This is all stuff that I, I know much less about. And so I can say much less about it, I'm, I'm afraid, but uh, just wanna point that out uh, to those of you who uh, might be interested um, and also to kind of situate this in some larger, larger context. So let, let's start, let's start with, uh, um, classical picture. So for those of you who've, who, who've um, you know, familiar with this, this sort of phase transition uh, business, I guess this, this may be old hat, although you know, I came to it quite late uh, in my career. I think I only kind of started learning about this through the holographic superconductor. And in fact, this is a picture. <laughs> this is a picture from one of my holographic superconductor papers where I have temperature on the, on the x-axis uh, and a superfluid velocity on the y-axis because the underlying system was conformally invariant. I have to kind of divide out by the chemical potential uh, to get some dimensionally uh, 
a dimensionless ratio. It's only these dimensionless ratios with respect to which interesting things happen. And there's an ordered phase uh, where phi is not equal to zero. There's a disordered phase where phi equals zero. There's a, a first order phase transition um, at relatively uh, low, low temperature. And there's a second order phase transition at relatively high temperature. And between them, there's this, this so-called tricritical point. Tricritical because you're supposed to have these sort of three different phases that coexist uh, at, that, at that special point. And in terms of the potential, uh, you know, what's happening, right? So if I have a phi to the six potential, I can get these three minima. If I tune um, M and R to zero, I just get, uh, sorry, if I, tune, uh, I, if I tune M and R to zero, I get this sort of tricritical point. And then if I keep sending R through uh, to, to negative values, sorry, to positive values, I guess, and just have m equals zero, I get the second order phase transition uh, down here at relatively high temperature. So that's this sort of classical uh, picture that emerges just from thinking about the potential I wrote down a few slides ago for this, for this theory. Um, I guess I should say a little bit more here. Um, So right, this is, this is what you get in three dimensions. So this is, you know, phi to the sixth is classically marginal in three dimensions. This is what they call the upper critical dimension uh, uh, for this system. If you were to go above three dimensions, this guy would be irrelevant. And I guess the sort of standard lore here is that uh, you should be able to apply uh, this theory uh, classically to any system in, in, in more than three dimensions. Three dimensions is some sort of boundary point at which the critical critical exponents might get some kind of logarithmic corrections, which indeed maybe seem to model these some of these experimental systems a little bit better. But then, as you go below three dimensions, uh, this term becomes relevant, and then the analysis becomes very similar to like the Wilson-Fisher fixed point in four dimensions, where you can tell a similar story about the phi to the fourth term. Um, and you can do this epsilon expansion. So we can, we, can, we can be a little bit more specific. So what actually happens in, in this phi to the six system uh, uh, quantum mechanically, if we go beyond the classical limit? So we have here a, uh, our, our bulk Lagrangian where I'm tuning to this tricritical point, tuning to this point where m equals r equals zero. I'm gonna put aside the boundary for a little bit. We'll come back to the boundary in a few slides. And I just wanna tell you about some things about this system when, when there isn't a boundary, because again, it's quite interesting and there's been a lot of work about it. Um, so this is my system at the tricritical point with just this phi to the sixth coupling. And I wanna do a large N analysis. And so the, the beta function for this system was calculated in a kind of tour de force calculation by Bazarsky back in 82. And he found the leading order uh, term was this guy, which I can plot. And it has two zeros, right? There's a zero, it's sort of double zero at, 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 in the classical limit at g equals zero. And then there's this UV fixed point way up here at g equals 192. Um, so that's, you know, that's the first pass. But actually, what I, what I want to do in this, in this story here, since I need a conformal field theory, I, I need my beta functions to vanish, right? And so the, the point of view I'm going to take in this paper is the following. It's that I have a 1 over n here. And so if I take the strict n goes to infinity limit, my beta function was just going to vanish. And so what I'm going to pretend to do is that this beta function does vanish, that I'm going to work in this strict large n limit. Uh, and, that, uh, and that I can use the techniques of conformal field theory or, or more specifically boundary conformal field theory here uh, to get at correlation functions and, and, and effective potentials and so forth. So that's gonna be the approach in this paper, but you know, we can look a little bit more specifically and ask what happens in, a, in the larger context where we look at these finite end corrections and you have this, I mean, really what happens is that it, at order one over N you have a UV fixed point um, and you're going to flow at low energies to this free uh, IR limit. 
That's what happens when you're at the upper critical dimension in these theories. And then there's been a lot of work where people, uh, for example, look in, in, the, in the three minus epsilon expansion, the epsilon expansion in these theories. And then that fixed point moves, the IR fixed point moves over a little bit and it's much more like phi to the fourth theory where now this is an IR fixed point, that's a UV fixed point and you can flow, you can flow uh, from, from some free limit in the UV to some fixed point in the IR and three minus epsilon dimensions. So I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna focus on this and I'm gonna pretend that my beta function vanishes exactly. That's gonna be the approach in this theory. Are there questions about that? Cause that, that's quite important. That's about you know, what's in the back of my, my head. And you know, for some of the experts in the audience, they might already be thinking, how can he do anything with this theory since it's all gonna be trivial. He's gonna just have to get, you know, he's gonna to have to set himself uh, at low energies in the IR at, at, at zero coupling and it's just a free theory. But that, that's not the approach here. The approach here is I'm, I'm taking advantage of the fact that it's large n and that the beta function is gonna be zero uh, to leading order. And I can just think of G as some marginal, approximately marginal coupling. Okay, that's clear. Well, let me say a little bit more here. So the fixed point here at, at g equals 192 is 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 not um, is it, it, kind of not clear. Um, there was a there was a, a later paper by Bardeen, Moshe, and Bander where they showed that you actually should get some kind of mass generation at uh, at g equals 16 pi squared, uh, which is approximately 158, which is less than 192. So something else happens here. Uh, even at large n, which kind of messes up this, this, this picture that, that Pizarski uh, wrote down in the early 80s. And we'll see this 16 pi squared from our, from our point of view. And I, I was talking also about recent work and a lot of recent work is kind of uh, about this, this kind of obscure thing that happens, whether you have this Pizarski fixed point at 192 or you have this Bardeen Moshe Bander point at, at, at 158. Uh, there's you know, recent work by uh, Seminoff and collaborators where they argue that, that uh, the BMB point maybe isn't really there at finite n. There's some kind of tachyon. Uh, there's another paper this year which is arguing for further zeros of the beta function when you look at one of our n and epsilon effects, trying to get it you know, this sort of tension between the, the BMB point and the, and the Pizarski point. But again, we're going to ignore most of this and just pretend we have a conformal field theory. All right, so that's it for the bulk. But this course is a boundary theory and I've got to say a little bit more about the boundary. So I have these three terms on the boundary and I wanna get rid of this one and I wanna ignore this one. So it turns out this, this guy, the phi partial Z phi term is just redundant. You can uh, just absorb it into some kind of boundary renormalization of the phi field. This was pointed out in the nice paper by Benamu and Mahu in the eighties. And then the phi to the fourth term, um, well, if I, if I have a non-zero uh, phi squared term, this should be the most important. This is some relevant operator and so it should dominate the behavior. And so as long as I've got this one on, I claim I can ignore this although there'll be some interesting room for further work if I also tune to the uh, multi-critical point where H1, H1 is zero or, or effectively zero. Okay, so this, this map boundary mass term, what does it do? So it's a relevant operator, it's like a, a boundary mass. And because it's relevant, it has, if, I, if I'm thinking in a, in a conformal field theory framework, a scale invariant framework, it has three natural values where you tune it to zero. That's what I don't wanna do because then I have to think about the phi to the fourth term or where it's effectively uh, really large and either positive or negative. So what happens when I add this term is I get a boundary term in the equations of motion, which say that the, the normal derivative of phi is proportional to this boundary mass this has to vanish. And in the bulk, the phi to the six coupling, it supports a behavior which is, it is not constant. So this is, this is not familiar, I think, uh, to most people who've, who've worked with these kinds of theories before. Usually you just pick some constant background for your fields. But here, because you've got this phi to the six and you've got a boundary, 
uh, you get to have a, a power law behavior for your, your background field. Often people call this some kind of surface ordering because it falls off as I move away from the surface. And so if H1 is negative, uh, that's compatible with this kind of uh, power law solution for the boundary. And this gives what's called extraordinary boundary conditions. If H1 is positive, it's not compatible uh, with this kind of uh, solution. And so what I'm forced to do is just set phi equal to zero. And so I get uh, Dirichlet or ordinary boundary conditions as, as a result. Okay, and then there's this famous phase diagram or maybe not so famous depending on <laughs> famous to those to whom it's famous. Um, this is a phase diagram. I think maybe Hans Diel often likes to, to, to write in his papers on these, these boundary conformal field theories. So again, I'm, I'm plotting the boundary mass versus uh, the bulk mass. And so as I, you know, as I, as I decrease the mass or the, or the temperature, I go from a disordered point where phi is zero uh, to a bulk ordered point where it's not zero. And then depending on how large H1 is, I either go through a, uh, I go through a, a, a point where the surface doesn't order first or where it does order first. Uh, so I would go you know, first to some kind of solution here where phi is proportional to one over root z and then to a point where phi is not zero. And then there's this special point in the middle uh, which I'm gonna ignore. So in today's talk, I'm either way out here or I'm way over here uh, by tuning H1 uh, to these two, two values, either very large and positive or very large and, and negative. And the boundary chordic coupling, I promised to say a little bit about it. Um, so there's an interesting observation way back from the 80s where they show that the fixed point so if, I'm, if, I'm, if I wanted to think about this special point, at that special point, I've got to tune not just G, uh, but H2 uh, in some three minus epsilon expansion uh, to some particular values. And it, it turns out that H2 squared is proportional to G. And I thought that was just, uh, it was kind of an interesting fact because it, 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 it's, it's sort of uh, similar to what happens in supersymmetry where if I had some super potential uh, which was phi to the four, that would give rise to a phi to the sixth potential in the bulk. But then to preserve supersymmetry, often we need to add that super potential as a boundary term. And so that would naturally give rise to the same kind of relation between the boundary and the bulk couplings. But again, I'm gonna ignore that uh, ever afterward in this talk, but it's, it's sort of an interesting uh, uh, similarity that I, I just wanted to, to point out. Okay, so I think that's the end of my really long motivation. I've taken, I guess, three quarters of my talk to, to get through it. Um, are, there, are there any questions? I, I'm now, I guess, going to go rather quickly through the computation of A and B in this, in this theory. So Chris, this theory, I mean, uh, in general, is like this Kubini instantons, right? But I guess I'm mean, you're in a- It's like this. Raising, there are these Kubini instantons, right? I mean, like, I mean, that, I'm not familiar with Kubini instantons. What, what, what do you mean? I... So there's some kind of instability depending on the value of this, uh, like uh, five to the six coupling. But I guess you are in some regime where the theory is stable, right? I mean, like in. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You say you say that the. I have, yeah, I don't. So there's this Bosham. Uh, Sorry, Bardeen Moshe Bander uh, point. So for G larger than this, the theory is supposed to be unstable. And we'll see that in our, our boundary analysis. I see. Um, okay. I haven't seen the words Fubini instantons associated with it. I, I, maybe, maybe we can talk later about it. I don't, I don't okay, know sure. what they are. Okay, so the way I'm going to do this is, is now very standard with, it, with a couple of uh, uh, wrinkles here and there, which I'll, I'll, I'll point out. So just like with Wilson-Fisher theory at large n, people usually introduce some Lagrange multiplier fields. And I'm gonna do exactly the same here. So my Lagrange multiplier fields will be sigma and chi. I need two of them for phi to the sixth theory or the theory winds up being non-analytic. So in Wilson-Fisher, you, you're often able to just get away with one. Here I need two, but it's the way it is. 
And now typically in this business, you, you, you divide things up and say background and fluctuations. And in the flat space without a boundary, you might just take your backgrounds to be constant. Uh, when I have a, a, a boundary, I have these power law solutions which are consistent with the remaining conformal symmetry in the theory. And so that's what I'll assume for the backgrounds that I have this Z to the one half fall off for the phi field that I was talking about just a couple slides ago and also similar fall offs for the other Lagrange multiplier fields. And so these capital letters, they're the, the coefficients of these power laws. And then I have fluctuations in these three fields as well that I'll allow for. So this is the, the classical term. And then at large n, there's a leading contribution at one loop, which comes from fluctuations in the phi fields. Since there are n of them, they wind up being dominant in the other fluctuations since there's just the other Lagrange multiplier fields, there's just one of each. Uh, they don't contribute a leading order at one loop. And so this is again, very standard, except uh, there's a position dependence in the mass term for the fluctuations. There's a one over z squared. And so one has to deal with that somehow. Okay, so what happens, right, is that uh, you know, my, my Lagrangian goes to my Lagrangian plus the contribution from the fluctuations, which is some determinant of this uh, operator, this, uh, this quadratic operator with this position dependent mass. Uh, and the way I did this, I guess, is maybe a little bit different from what you'll see in, in the old papers. I took advantage again of the, of the boundary conformal symmetry. So sigma, I can think of as some source uh, for the, the, the mass term. So if I vary my partition function with, with respect to that source, I get the integrated uh, mass term, delta phi squared. And in a boundary conformal field theory, this gets some expectation value. One point functions in boundary conformal field theory are not zero uh, and they're fixed up to a number by the conformal symmetry. So I know that delta phi squared has to have this one over z behavior. Um, and I, I I furthermore that know that I can get it by looking at the two-point function uh, for this, these fluctuations and taking the coincident limit where x goes to zero and then carefully regulating. And so what happens when the dust settles, there's a, there's a somewhat long computation here, which involves some hypergeometric functions and complicated looking integrals. But when the dust settles, I get a very simple correction uh, to the effective potential. Uh, which for reasons I don't completely understand looks exactly like the correction that the people were getting in the 80s uh, when they did this computation without having a boundary. So I have this extra term here that I have to add to my potential. So an irritating feature of uh, working in flat spaces, it's not really a potential. I mean, I have, I have the Z dependence and my fields are Z dependent. Uh, and it would be nicer to just have a potential uh, where I don't have to worry about kinetic terms. So with the kinetic terms there, it's sort of more difficult to understand like what's a higher, higher energy solution, what's a lower energy solution. And so there's a nice trick here that we took advantage of, which is that if we don't work in flat space, uh, we can do a vial transformation and work in anti de Sitter space instead. And when we do this vial transformation, since everything we're kind of at this sort of conformal point, all the excuse me, all the z-dependence just disappears and all the background values for the fields just become constant instead of z-dependent. Uh, and so if we do this vial transformation from my, this, 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 uh, this flat space computation with boundary to anti de Sitter space, uh, then we do indeed get a, uh, an effective potential without, without derivatives that we could you know, go and plot and think about what's higher energy and what's lower energy. And that's, that's sitting down there at the bottom. So the, the, those, those capital Greek letters, again, those are the values of the background fields. And so we can try and look for minima and maxima uh, to try and understand the phase, phases of these, of, this, of these theories. And here it is. This is, I think, one of the central results of this paper uh, that we worked out. Um, and I can, can try and walk you through what, what's going on here. Um, it's sort of interesting. I'm not completely sure I, I totally understand what's going on in all its, all its detail, but let me, let me share with you what I do understand. So, so what I'm plotting here is, is, is the potential as a function of the coupling G at the critical points, and there are many. Um, 
So you notice, I'll just point out here, there was a plus or minus, which has to do with the boundary conditions uh, that I'm choosing uh, for the fields already. So there's two branches of solutions. Um, there's an upper branch, which is this red line and this dotted line. And there's a lower branch, which is this red line and these two dotted lines. And the red lines are ordinary. Uh, so that's the case where, where the, the, the phi field is just zero. And the, the dotted lines are extraordinary. That's the case where phi has this, this square root of z fall off as you go away from the boundary. And uh, okay, so what else can I say here? So there's different regimes. There's a, there's, a, there's a regime where G is less than zero, where the potential is unbounded. And I've got these two branches, which give me maxima, uh, where, where, where the, the system's disordered, where phi is zero. And it's not clear to me, already there's something here that's not completely clear to me. These are, I'm in ADS, and even though the potential is unbounded, um, the, uh, you know, the mass term here is above the brighton loner friedman bound. So am I supposed to throw these solutions out or not? So that already is a little bit obscure to me. Maybe conservatively you'd say, since the potential is unbounded, I should just ignore G less than zero. It seems sort of physically reasonable that maybe negative interaction should be unstable. Another weird thing happens way out here at G equals 16 pi squared. This is the Bosch, uh, sorry, bardeen moshe bander point. And there's no ordinary solution. Uh, so we see that in our language, the fact that there's no ordinary solution for G larger than that. For G larger than that, the potential here, so these are the, the potential, it just does, it's not well defined uh, at the origin and field space. There's no, it, the, the potential becomes kind of complex valued here and just doesn't exist. So there's no way to get an ordinary solution here. And then uh, in the middle, uh, we get these, 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 these different systems. Um, and uh, so, you know, if, if you allow for the, if the, if the boundary is allowed to have extraordinary, uh, this extraordinary behavior, if, if this H1 uh, was negative and large, then this looks like it would be the, the dominant solution for most of the coupling. And it even persists uh, past this BMB point. If, um, Instead, you want uh, uh, H1 to be uh, positive so that you, you don't support the surface ordering, you don't support having this ordered surface, uh, then maybe the, the dominant solution should be this red line, which will only exist up to this, uh, this BMB point. Okay, so that, that was one of the, the main, uh, main results of, of the paper was this phase diagram. Uh, and I think there's more to say here, but I, I don't know what it is. Are there questions about this? I've also drawn here the, the, the form of the potential. So that here I've integrated out the other uh, auxiliary fields and you, you can see, sort of see what's going on here. Um, like in this little region way down here where the lower branch has these uh, three minima and that dimple becomes lower than the two ordered phases. So there's this little region in here where actually the, the, the disordered phase is, is stable. So that's what these, these, these diagrams here are. So, so this particular area where uh, the potential is kind of complex, right? I mean, can you interpret that as some kind of tunneling like uh, phenomenon? Like... Yeah, I, I really don't know what to say about it. I mean, I, I, I naively would have just said, well, oh, oh good, that, that seems to make sense that, you know, Bardeen and, and company told us the theory shouldn't make sense for G larger than this. And indeed the potential isn't well-defined. Um, there's some runaway behavior, but may, I think there may well be some more sophisticated thing to say about it, about, I don't know, complex saddle points or, or tunneling, I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But this is the large end analysis. Uh, right. This is what comes out of that potential. Okay, so we're almost at the, 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 the punchline for one of these computations um, for the A-type anomaly. Uh, so it, if, if I think about this computation in anti de Sitter space, which I said was you know, a cheap trick for getting rid of the kinetic terms in, in the effect of Lagrangian, um, 
But it's also a nice way of getting at this A-type anomaly because, well, now I just have a constant potential. Uh, if I integrate that by the volume, I get an effective, I, I, you know, I get these sort of, a, how should I say this? I, it was sort of a potential density. And now if I integrate that over the volume, I can, it just corresponds to multiplying by the volume that gives me the effective potential, this W from which I was gonna compute the, uh, the conformal anomaly A. Well, the volume of, of this hyperbolic space, well, it's divergent, but people have these standard ways of regularizing it in terms of logarithms. So it winds up just being two pi log of some cutoff. And then I plug that into my formula uh, for A and I find that A is nothing but pi times uh, this V that I was plotting before. So this, this plot I had is also secretly A. It's secretly the anomaly coefficient A, the boundary anomaly coefficient A for this theory which maybe is kind of nice, right? Because A is supposed to have some kind of monotonicity property under RG flow and V also you'd like to minimize somehow to find stable solutions. So there's some nice interplay between those two ideas, uh, which I can't make more precise than that, but it, it seems very attractive. And there's a sanity check here as well. Uh, you can look at the, the G equals zero case where I have a free theory, it's either Neumann or Dirichlet. Um, and I get the right answer, I get uh, plus or minus one over 96. And those, those computations are actually done surprisingly recently in the last 10 years. Those are just these points here. These are the, the perturbative points. This is Neumann up top and Dirichlet on the bottom, uh, one over 96. So we get those right. So how much more time do I have? One minute. Uh oh. Sorry. So you can have five minutes if you need. Five minutes? Okay. So I'll try to go through this much more quickly. This is a much more technical part of the paper. And, and um, I can, I mean, a lot of what, what we did was just uh, done before in a slightly different context. So maybe I can go very quickly. So, so the idea here for the B type anomaly is uh, to look at a stress tensor two point function and then take the boundary limit which is the displacement displacement uh, two point function that gives us this coefficient CNN and CNN in turn is related to B. Right? That's what I said at the beginning. So there's a little bit of uh, setup here. Uh, you know, the, the, the stress sensor two point function is basically fixed up to one function of an invariant cross ratio by tracelessness and conservation. We'll take that cross ratio to be this number. That's important to remember that V equals zero is the coincident limit. That's where the the numerator vanishes where the two points come together and V equals one is the boundary limit. That's where Z uh, vanishes. And then the, 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 re the remaining ratio just goes to one. And what is the function I wanna focus on? It's just gonna be uh, the function that I use to define the, the normal, normal, the normal, the normal, normal component of the stress tensor two point function will be this thing I called alpha V. So I claim if I know alpha V, I actually know the full stress tensor two point function. And furthermore, a short computation can convince you that alpha of one is actually just the CNN, which is in turn B. That's the strategy. So the computation, as I say, it gets kind of uh, grungy. There's some uh, free field contribution, which you just get through Wick's theorem by contracting you know, you write down the stress tensor two point function, you do some wick contractions of the fields. And then there's a, unfortunately a rather hard part which involves exchanging one of these sigma fields, this Lagrange multiplier fields. Uh, but we had some help there. We had this old paper by McCavity and Osborne where they do something very similar in phi to the fourth theory. So that's what we followed. Follow that, we get the answer. We get the answer in terms of the solution to some second order di linear differential equation. I've written it here, uh, convince you we did some work. I'm introducing a, a new quantity mu, uh, mu, but I can write mu just in terms of the coupling G. So I'll, I'll use mu and G kind of interchangeably as we go forward here. So once we have the solution for this, I claim we know this alpha V and then we know the full stress tensor two point function. We weren't able to solve this differential equation completely. Um, we got a few special values of G uh, and uh, we also were able to get alpha of one, which is the, uh, what we need to get this, this anomaly coefficient um, in terms of an integral, which we could evaluate numerically. 
So, um, you know, here's, here's alpha V in the few cases we know analytically where G is 12 pi squared or zero. Remember there are these two branches of the solution or minus infinity and they're kind of messy uh, expressions. This is mu at one or, or G is 12 pi squared. You can look at the paper for the other ones. And here's my integral expression for alpha of one. So here are these rather complicated expressions. I don't know how to do this integral exactly. Maybe one of you can. I, I have a feeling it can be done. We just weren't able to do it. We could get a, a, a saddle point approximation at large mu or, or equivalently large G. That's this red line. It's just 2.54 mu. And then we got these uh, special values. And we can also do the thing numerically, which is what this blue line is, okay. So the more interesting part though, is that this is all related to this B-type anomaly. Um, so I wanted to just make a few remarks about this and then and I guess kind of wrap up. So, so let, let, let's see, what do we have? We have that B is related to alpha of one. And we have from before that A was equal to pi times this effective potential V. And in fact, in the ordinary case, I'm only able to do this stress tensor computation in the ordinary case where there's no surface ordering. In that case, I can write this A just in terms of this new parameter mu. It winds up just being linear in mu. So the first thing I'll just point out is that since alpha of zero uh, is independent of u, it's independent of the coupling, it's just some number. If you go away from the boundary, uh, this two point function doesn't care about this coupling. So in the, the, the quantity B or equivalently alpha one is not linear in mu. However, A is manifestly. And so these quantities are not simply related. That was something we hoped might be true. We had even a conjecture uh, in a paper from 2018 that there might be some simple relation between these anomalies, but that's not, that's violated by this example. Previous examples, we couldn't say anything. So that, that's one, one thing nice about this model. We're able to have, a, a, a lar as I say, a larger data set to try and understand what, what may or may not be true about these anomalies. And the other thing I wanna say about this, uh, there were early discussions about these, this B-type anomaly that, that maybe the, the bulk limit of alpha and the boundary limit might be related somehow. So it's known that like in all the free field cases that twice alpha zero is equal to alpha one. And alpha zero, that, that's the coincident limit in the bulk. So it's the kind of limit where the boundary disappears. It's like the central charge. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the stress tensor two point function, the coincident limit. So it's like this bulk central charge. There's some hope that these, you know, these coefficients might be related to the bulk and the boundary uh, uh, limit of this, of this two point function. And again, what you, what you see here is, you, well, you see the two in the free cases, the free cases correspond to mu equals a half and mu equals minus a half. And then, but, but clearly away from that, <laughs> it's not true. Uh, but then you think, well, maybe there's even some bound. Maybe the free limit is some bound, like alpha one is always less than two times alpha zero or alpha one is always greater than two times alpha zero. And again, that, that also doesn't seem to be true. You know, if G is negative, uh, then the ratio is less than two. But if G is positive, the ratio is greater than two. Um, so I don't know what to make of that if, if there's some more general conjecture that can be extracted from this example, but, but at least the, the simple claim that you know, alpha one is always less than two alpha zero doesn't, doesn't seem to be true. Uh, so, uh, and we didn't, okay, so again, you, you might say, well, G, G less than zero, that, that should maybe be unstable. Maybe we should just throw that, that example out. But in fact, you know, the nice examples we had before, uh, there was this graphene-like example, which had precisely that ratio, alpha one less than two alpha zero. So I don't, I don't know quite what to make of this. And also the, the McCavity osborne example is, is, is sitting down here in that, in that limit, so. All right, so I think that's, that's all I wanna say. There's some further results in the paper. You can ask me about them if you want. I reviewed this phi to the six scalar field theory and some uh, notions about boundary anomalies. I computed A and B for you, the boundary anomaly and the trace of the stress tensor for this theory. Uh, I and I invalidated a couple of conjectures about the behavior of A and B, that A in particular, A is not proportional to B and that A is not bounded by C, at least in any straightforward way uh, that I can say at the moment. 
And there's lots of stuff I didn't do. I didn't tell you about the special transition, uh, which is you know in between this ordinary and extraordinary bit. I didn't tell you about two-point functions in the extraordinary case. I didn't tell you about one over n effects or breaking conformal symmetry. I didn't explore very much bounds on G or closer relations to experiment. These are all kind of interesting projects that uh, might be nice to pursue in the future. Okay, well, thanks, thanks for your time. I've gone on too long. Uh, please ask questions. Great, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for the very interesting talk. So any questions? Could you tell uh, once again about the, this, uh, the A coefficient, uh, you kind of pass by rather quickly uh, the monotonicity property in your computation. So you got A was proportional to the effective potential, but then you said that it, it has the uh, correct monotonicity property under RG, is that what you were saying? Um, what did I say? I said there's a theorem by uh, O'Bannon and Jensen that under boundary RG flow, A is monotonic. Uh, that's, that's just a, a known theorem. Uh, and I, I, was, I wasn't saying anything very precise. I wish I could say something more precise. I was just saying that I, I kind of like this relation between A and V uh, because in the same way that this suggests some kind of minimization procedure that A you know, decreases under some kind of renormalization group flow. Uh, similarly, when we talk about potentials, uh, we like to minimize them. We like to sit at, uh, you know, we like to sit at minima of potentials. Ugh. We like to sit at minima potentials. And so there's some sense here too, where maybe uh, uh, decrease under RG flow, you might be able to understand this, this, this relation to decrease under RG flow and the fact that it's, a, it's effective potential uh, more precisely. But at the moment, I, I, I can't say anything more, but maybe that's intellectual sloppiness on my part, but uh, at least at this sort of high level, there's, I, I like this sort of uh, parallelism in the, in the concepts. Sure, sure, okay. Thanks. So by the way, have you, uh, do you think that if one does the calculation holographically, like for example, in the Janus solution, would, would you get like I mean, the similar kind of effective potential? Like in, uh... um, the thing, um, oh, there's, there's sort of a lot to say. I'm not exactly sure what to say. Um, I mean, in holography, we often talk about this probe limit um, where we, we decouple gravity, at least I've, I've done in some of my papers. And I, I think in that limit, there really is a very close relationship between what we do in holography and what I was doing here. Uh, you know, these computations on a half space with boundary just through vial transformation become uh, field theory computations in ADS. Uh, right. This has been pointed out by various people. There's a nice paper by Carmi and DiPietro about this. Uh, so in, in that sense, yeah, I think, I think there, there probably is some very close connections. Now, once you throw gravity into the mix, I'm not, not much less sure about uh, my footing. Um, that seems like it conceptually would be a bit different. Well, uh, and more it's generally, I, I also, yeah, go ahead. So, well, I mean, just like a matter of technical difficulty, right? I mean, like I mean, when you have the back reaction. Yeah. Yeah, but is there still, is there, I mean, you, you don't. I guess it should be the same, right? I mean, I. 
I, I think the answer must be yes, but I, I don't see all the details. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, more generally, I just say I'm also very interested in computing these anomalies from a holographic point of view, and I, th there's been some some work on that. At least for the, the A type ones, I think are often rather straightforward to get from holography, either through kind of entanglement or right. uh, partition function type calculations. The B type ones seem to be harder so far. Yeah, Andy has like some like I think also with Kristen, right? I mean, they have like this kind of entanglement calculation of. And yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions for Chris? Okay, so if not, uh, like, uh, let's thank uh, Chris again, like, uh, for the very nice talk. So, uh, Maybe I'll stop the recording and...